Okay. So gang's all here. And we're not experiencing technical difficulties, which is really exciting. <laughs> Uh, given the, our experience last week when we tried to have a meeting with uh, the Yukon crew and uh, nobody, could, uh, nobody could speak to anybody. <laughs> so we're already ahead of the game. Um, thank you. This is the Appropriations Committee's um, Subcommittee on Higher Education. Uh, this is a working meeting with uh, representatives from the CSEU system. I see a number of people... Um, uh, are here. Um, I, I, um, I, I don't know, there's at least one uh, a, a person who's in the group who's identified only as a number, 001, uh, something, something else. Uh, oh, I don't that's know. Valentina. Okay, very good. Just wanted to know who, who it was. I mean, if you guys want to introduce uh, yourselves, and then I think what we will probably do is just start working through um, the questions that were submitted I think it would be probably the best use of our time just to uh, be able to uh, hear the, uh, the, your responses to the questions and have us be able to ask some follow-up questions as, um, as we go through them. Somebody want to take the lead? And sure, I'll, I'll take the lead. Hello, I'm David Levinson, the interim president of Connecticut State Community College. Thank you for the opportunity this afternoon to be before you. Thank you. And uh, Sean Bradbury here, you know, most of you know me, Senior Director of Government Relations and External Affairs for CSCU. Hi, Ben. Uh, I don't know if I'm muted or not. I'm Ben Barnes, the CFO for the CSU system. And uh, Dr. Alice Pritchard, uh, Chief of Staff and Chief Operations Officer. Thanks for having us. Hi, I'm Carrie Kelly. I'm the Interim Vice President of Finance and Administration for the uh, Connecticut State Community College. Happy to be here on St. Patrick's Day. Hi, I can uh, go next. I'm Allison Buckley. I'm Vice President for Enrollment Management and Student Affairs um, for Connecticut State Community College. Thanks. Hi, I am Melantina Pustai. I am the Director of Budgets and Planning for the Connecticut State Colleges and Universities. Okay, great. I think that's your, your whole team and uh, we appreciate that you're all made yourselves available to us so that we can um, uh, go through the answers that you provided to our questions, which I think were, were asked in our initial session um, at, um, at the public hearing. Um, I'll just uh, I'll try to just sort of direct us through, but the first um, question, regard, there were a number of questions around uh, funding for the PACT program. I don't know who the best person is to, um, to start answering questions, but I'll, uh, I'll just ask you to sort of give us the sort of the high level rundown of your answers and uh, we'll see if there are any follow-up questions. I think we'll let Ben, ben run um, and then defer to others where he wants some backup, but thanks, Ben. Yeah, no, I um, I did the math on this one, so I might as well be the one to answer the questions. So we were able um, to, uh, using the actual data from the awards in the fall, we haven't finalized all of our awards for the spring semester because there are still some students who are in late start classes and a couple of reasons why that data was not perfect yet. Um, but we, uh, using the data from the the final data from the fall and some of the preliminary data from the spring were able to develop a more, um, I mean, a less speculative model for how the PAC program, what the PAC program is going to cost. Obviously, uh, it was much easier to project those costs knowing what they were recently. Uh, based on that and using, so what we did is we looked at the uh, normal survival of, of uh, first time ever in college students in the community college system on average over uh, in recent years, we kind of discarded the pandemic year because it's been so unusual, uh, but taking average survival rates from, you know, students who start one fall, how many of them show up the following spring and the following fall and out a number of semesters, we were able to um, uh, project what we think the cost will be for um, the PAC program as it's currently configured going forward. Uh, and those were provided to you all. We think the program 
the full cost of the program this year, uh, if we were to have, uh, you know, had we awarded to every student who was eligible, would have been about $8.9 million. Uh, we spent uh, just over six. Um, and uh, going forward, we believe that uh, for fiscal 22, the cost of the program as currently configured would be uh, just under $14 million, $13.9 million. Uh, and then that number would go up a little bit uh, and bounce around between 14 and $15 million uh, out into the future uh, based on today. A couple caveats I would like to point out. One is that the fall, while it is actual data, it is actual data from the middle of a pandemic. So um, I, uh, I'm a little, I'm still a little uncertain about that. Uh, because of that, we took the um, number of students who, who were eligible in the fall of 20, of 20 and assumed that that would increase by 15% or so for the fall of 21. That's in line with our overall projection uh, for the system uh, and reflects essentially a bounce back from uh, the loss of enrollment that we experienced during the pandemic. You know, obviously that number could be over or underestimated and uh, you know, there could be other um, uh, enrollment repercussions over time, but uh, generally speaking, I think these are pretty reasonable estimates uh, and reflect the normal attrition of students out of, out of our programs. And by attrition in this case, I mean, not only dropping out, but also completing and graduating and moving on, uh, you know, those folks uh, from the perspective of the cost of the program, that doesn't really make any difference. So we think the program is ultimately gonna go to about $14 million. Um, we're not able to, the last question uh, that we had had to do with the inclusion of part-time students. We um, uh, have been struggling to get a good estimate of that. Um, there's a, there are a number of uh, data concerns and, and issues that we're not uh, fully satisfied that we have a good answer on what the part-time students will cost. Uh, it is... Um, uh, Part-time students generally have a much higher levels of attrition from one semester to the next than full-time students. Uh, and um, uh, we have, uh, and we had a, such a steep drop off in part-time students this year. Um, uh, in particular, we're, we're very uncertain about that, but we're continuing to work through. We have some new uh, data that we're um, uh, trying to gather in order to uh, put together a part-time estimate. We don't think that it is going, a lot of the concerns have to do with what would the eligibility criteria for those part-time students be. Um, I'm not sure the current set of criteria make a whole lot of sense when you're applying it to part-time students, uh, but we're gonna, we'll, we should within the next week or two be able to provide you with a, a pretty detailed projection of what it would cost for part-time students using the current eligibility criteria, first time ever in college and uh, and uh, Connecticut High School graduate and everything else. So we're, we're working on that uh, and should have it. I expect it will be several million dollars more uh, uh, to include part-time students, but I'm, I'm reluctant to go much more detailed until we have a, a more confidence in our model. Your, your answer, uh, and this is at the bottom of page one, I think it sort of essentially implies that the, that, that if PAC were fully funded for full-time students at $14 million, that the total value of additional tuition dollars that you collect, including student loan dollars, right, um, mm. is $50 million for, this, for the community college system? Is that, is that how I read this question? Yes, I mean, that's why, I mean, if, if, if the intention of expanding PACs to part-time students is to cover everybody or to cover a vast majority of students, then um, you know we could. There still are fifty million dollars that we're collecting. That does include non-credit students, workforce right. programming, people in certificate programs, uh, et cetera. Right now, um, those would not be counted as matriculated students in a degree program, and so they would not be eligible for PACT. Um, so I'm hoping when we provide you with an estimate that we could not only say this is how much it would cost for the current eligible group, but sort of obvious other groups we might expand it to, we could identify what the cost of those uh, of those would be. Right, PACT is limited to uh, first-time students in the system, and so that, that other dollar amount would also include you know folks who are returning 
for secondary degrees, uh, people from out of state, to the, to the extent that that happens very frequently. Uh, um, you, you know, imagine it happens at a couple of the community colleges along the border, but not much. Mm -hmm. uh, that sort of stuff. But I, see, I understand that the thing. The other thing, I'm, I'm encouraged to hear that you included a 15% um, sort of increase in enrollment. I, I, I completely appreciate how difficult it must be to model this. Um, none of us anticipated um, that this program was launched during the middle of a pandemic. Um, none of us anticipated that we would be having this conversation this year and not last year. Um, although we, we started having it last year, we hope to finish it this, this year. Um, and, and be able to provide, uh, identify a funding source and, and to provide it. Um, I think that um, from my perspective, that's critical to the success of the program, obviously. Um, we appreciate that you have invested um, reserve money to launch this program during the first year, uh, its inaugural year. Um, I, um, I would also just say like, I completely appreciate how difficult that has been given the other um, impacts that the system has been under um, the, as a result of the, of the pandemic. Um, so both enrollment in, this, in the program is probably down slightly, but um, you're doing it on a shoestring um, and during a, a time when um, you know, there's so many demands um, out there. So I, I, I appreciate all that effort. And I, I would just really like to recognize that Dr. Gates joined us as well. Um, <laughs> Uh, we had a round of introductions, but we're but we're glad um, we're glad you're able to join us today. We've Thank you. Thank you so much for the opportunity for everyone to uh, have this work session on budgetary needs for CSCO. Yeah. Um, uh, I uh, are there any other questions um, that people might have about the response that the system has given us to question number one? And you can either, uh, if you're on screen, you can raise your hand or you can raise your hand virtually in the participant thing. But if there are no other questions, um, then we will move on to question number two, which is regarding unfunded accrued liability. Yes, um, we provided a table with the unfunded accrued by, I mean, since it was requested in the table, we, we complied. Um, uh, and the numbers are uh, uh, approximately $22 million in unfunded liability in the universities, about 15 in the community colleges, uh, uh, and just under a million for Charter Oak for a total of $38.6 million in um, uh, unfunded liability. Pay I mean, uh, this was based on um, uh, our we received uh, projected fringe benefit rates from um, Bob Gribben at the comptroller's office uh, not long ago, and we're able to use those to develop these estimates. There was a relatively significant increase in unfunded liability contained in those estimates uh, as a result of the amortization schedule that the state is pursuing now. Um, and, and so just as a follow up to that, I just want to be sure. So we're talking in this, is this table represent just the, the pension for the pension portion of unfunded or, le or legacy costs? Or is there a, is there a healthcare component? This is just, um, this is just, the question was asked for SIRS UAL. Yeah. So we did not include uh, payments of unfunded liability for the uh, OPEB, OPEB liability. Um, so thank you for that. I just wanted to clarify that. And then again, this is uh, this is the amount that is charged to the uh, to the system uh, by uh, the comptroller's office to compensate for the the um, the comptroller for its expenditures uh, and payments into the unfunded uh, accrued liability um, um, sort of spend down or pay down. Um, Correct. And, this, and, 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 and this is just, this isn't for all employees, just to clarify, this isn't for all employees, this is just for the employees that you pay for off of your own revenue sources, right? Um, In that other is words, correct. if they're a block granted yeah. employee, that, that's not included here. A block granted employee is, is, is currently under current law covered by the state comptroller's office. This is just the portion of the unfunded accrued liability that's paid for out of your own revenue sources. 
Uh, well, yes, but with one caveat, within the community college system, there is, and this is the unfunded liability that we pay out of our operating funds. There is some, uh, we do receive operating fund fringe benefit support from the legislature uh, amounting to about $35 million uh, a year, this biennium uh, that goes toward paying for our, um, our our fringe benefits for those who are not covered under the block grant. Uh, that covers most of the remaining uh, uh, liability. Uh, obviously, one of the items we've identified as you know, troubling to us in the governor's budget proposal was the uh, failure to renew about 20, a uh, little over $20 million of that uh, operating fund fringe benefit support. Um, so, so right in the current year, those are covered in the 22 budget as proposed by the governor. Um, a portion of the community college unfunded liability uh, uh, could be uh, assumed to be covered by the remaining 60 million or so of fringe benefit support that is in the governor's budget. Are there any additional follow -up questions on this uh, point from members of the committee? None. I'm the only one with one of the questions today. I don't know. <laughs> uh, item number three is a question around uh, collective bargaining agreements. Well, we've provided the language uh, that in, that impacts um, uh, that impacts online students and class size. Each contract is a little different. Um, I I don't know if. Uh, if there are any specific questions about that, um, we can certainly uh, get uh, answers to you know how those are implemented. But uh, they sort of I mean, I speak for themselves insofar as collective bargaining agreement language ever is self-explanatory, which it seldom is. But uh, these are the descriptions of the um, uh, of the provisions related to workload for online instruction. Yeah, I, I don't recall who at the public hearing who asked this question, but um, uh, Senator this, Minor. Senator Minor, this I mean this language though is um, uh, uh, are in, in con is, is contractual, and your contracts don't expire until when would this contract these what would the range of expiration dates for these contracts be? June thirtieth, twenty twenty one. All okay, of them so you're, expire. You're, so you're currently renegotiating contracts. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right. <clears throat> well, we'll be waiting with beta breath to say that. Well, I will say that all of these provisions were uh, agreed to at a time uh, before we uh, figured out how to pivot to all online instruction. So they, they may not seem entirely relevant to the facts uh, in front of us today. Yeah. Um, I don't know if, uh, if somebody else could sort of speak to this, but let, um, let me, I guess the, the sort of the follow-up question I have to you know the fact that this is raised at all is um, are there is it are there any efficiencies involved in the online delivery of higher education courses um, uh, that would lead someone to believe that you could significantly expand the number of students assigned in a course section or to a, to a, to, a, to a professor um, and realize savings as a result. Um, it seems to me, uh, with my own experience with my uh, admittedly only seven-year-old daughter, um, but also in you know, just the way that we operate at the General Assembly uh, this way, that, that, it's, um, that it's not clear to me that it's easier to, to deliver uh, course instruction this way than it would be in person. And so I'm wondering what the relationship is between you know, your perspective on delivering um, academic instruction um, online versus uh, in person and whether or not there are cost savings or efficiencies that are involved in, in that difference. I, look, we, we have saved a lot of money on certain things during the pandemic. You know, we don't have to buy as much, uh, you know, supplies for the restrooms and things like that, which are being, un buildings are being unused. Uh, in terms of instruction though, I don't particularly see that as a major factor. Um, I don't know, uh, Dr. Gates, do you want to talk a little bit about the, um, the uh, efforts we've been putting into um, 
professional development for faculty to make that conversion because I think that that has been uh, the area where we've really focused trying to um, make that as successful as possible, make that as easy as possible for our faculty. And, and, yes. and just, I mean, I mean the, the question's really about, you know, what used to be called MOOCs, right? Like these, you know, yes. you know and, 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 and my, my understanding, frankly, is that um, possible savings were sort of overstated when we first sort of venturing down this path because it's still about a relationship between the student and the professor. Uh, but I, that, that's what I'm getting at, and I'm trying to figure out if um, if the reason why this question was asked is because it was trying to anticipate whether or not there would be uh, the opportunity to do things differently and and but as effectively as uh, if it's in person. Thank you, Representative Haddad, but I would say that there is efficiency in our ability to offer diverse learning modalities. And this is specifically true with respect with our focus on increasing adult learners. Those individuals are already gainfully employed. They're able to take a course whenever it's offered anywhere. And we can also expand our course offerings beyond the state of Connecticut. So in that sense, we can move forward the um, argument that yes, there is efficiency because we can't uh, always offer the traditional modality. And it does give students, the learners, uh, options. And that's what we're moving toward. More, most recently, I've read research uh, post-pandemic era on learning modalities. And the conclusion is that we will never go back to the traditional uh, component. We will always offer uh, hybrids. We will offer mixed modalities. So in that sense, I think if we are um, continuing to build institutions for 21st learners, we have to be able to meet their needs. So in that sense, yes. With respect to the labor, I too have been somewhat engaged in the online and I understand what you're seeing and family members who are not only working at home, I have two grandkids, two-year-old, five-year-old, and they've been doing Chrome notebook, learn, learning at home and the parents uh, too. So it is quite, it is laborious in part because many of our faculty were not ready for the flip immediately from traditional learning to remote learning. But we have provided, I think for over 2000 faculty and we continue to provide a professional development. With respect to, if we're looking at the cost here that Ben uh, responded to, it just very much the efficiency factor is I think what matters. Uh, I can't argue that the cost in, in this sense is more effective because if one has 20 students in person and 20 students online, or 30 students online, there are modules out there where one can offer a synchronized lecture and then break that online class, just as we would in person, into different groups. So there are lots of things out there that are available to higher education where we can make this a very efficient um, learning process for our students. Does that in speak in part representative to your question? I don't want to go on and on here. I appreciate that. No, it does. I mean, I, I, I just, I, I mean, I, I think that the original question just sort of, you know, I think was probably comes from a place where they thought that there might be, perhaps I know I'm speculating, that there might have been some um, some cost savings to the online delivery of courses in the in, on the instructional side, not just on the you know, you know the supply side in terms of buildings and mortar. But um, and I and I just uh, you know obviously we're locked into the contract. As you renegotiate a contract, you might end up with looser language here. But I, um, I, I you know I just I I, I wonder if um, class sizes through virtual instruction could suddenly double um, and not um, have a, a, an impact on the quality of instruction? That is a very interesting question because there is a divergent literature out there 
when we talk about class size, for example, English is different because writing, that's laborious. But if we're talking about class size, uh, many argue that that really does not make that much of a difference. It is the pedagogical approach and how one engages with our students, with our learners. So we, we can find arguments on both sides of that, Representative. Okay, thank, thank you for that, that answer, I guess. I mean, it's like a sort of a mixed bag, I guess, but I, I get it. Um, you know, there's not a, not a clear answer. And I guess as you negotiate the new contracts, um, undoubtedly, since you're going to be looking at uh, not returning solely to the sort of in-person class model, but well, as you said, like we'll be using mixed modality for delivery instruction into the future. I imagine the con future contracts will recognize um, that change as well. Thank you. Um, so moving on, um, question number four is about plans for use of stimulus funds. Um, you know, you know there are um, there are a lot of dollars out there. I mean, and and I and I want to be clear that when we that when you answer um, these questions, I, I think it's important for us to also understand what what um, what lost uh, revenue and what additional expenditures have been incurred as a result of uh, the pandemic, and uh, to talk about um, any additional funds that you get in terms of mitigating uh, whatever losses that you might have also occurred, incurred. But obviously um, there's um, a, a, you know, a fair amount of resources on the table and will be sent to you to sort of help, help you through this um, difficult time. Um, if you could start in terms of uh, providing your answer in this um, with, a, with a short sort of glossary for, for me, I'm getting lost, I'll, I'll, be admit, I'll admit, I'm getting lost in the alphabet soup of this all. Um, and if there's a quick way of sort of just giving, letting me sort of understand what it is, what pots of money we're talking about and when they might have arrived, um, that would be helpful to me as I um, digest uh, the, the remainder of your question, your answers to the question. Sure, uh, I'm, I'm happy to take a stab at that. We have received three rounds of stimulus funds that have been approved by the United States Congress. The first, which was approved early in the pandemic was was uh, as part of the CARES Act, which you may recall. Uh, and in the CARES Act, there was created something called the Higher Education Emergency Relief Fund, uh, colloquially known as the HERF, because it's federal government likes uh, difficult to pronounce acronyms. So the HERF funds uh, that, that we received from the CARES Act amounted to uh, $54.5 million, um, and that was more or less evenly split between the universities and the community colleges. There was nothing for Charter Oak because it, ex it ex explicitly excluded online institutions. Then uh, the CRISA, the Comprehensive Relief and something, uh, Supplemental Appropriations Act, uh, was passed in late December um, and, uh, of 2020. Uh, and that included uh, what, what we, I internally refer to, and I think a lot of folks in the business refer to as HERF II. Uh, and so that was a continuation of the higher education uh, relief fund, um, but it had some new rules. So the rules for the spending of HERF I were significantly broadened in HERF II. Um, and then uh, just now under the, uh, uh, American Rescue Plan Act that was just signed, I believe a few days ago. Uh, there is a further fund source of funds, which I'll call, we're calling here three. Um, so there are, the rules are a little different for each of them. Here for one, 50% uh, was required to be spent on student assistance and 50% could go for institutional purposes. Uh, but the rules that were put in place by the administration at that time for use of, on both sides were really quite difficult to comply with. Um, so we've struggled to uh, make sure that, you know, it's been, a, it's been a lot of effort to make sure that the use of our funds uh, meets the requirements of the, uh, of the act and of the, all the guidance that was put out by the United States Department of Education. Um, so for instance, the, uh, on student financial assistance, it, they were required that everyone be Title IV eligible, which course, is not a ter uh, legally defined. Does that mean that they actually filled out a FAFSA and, and are, uh, you know, or did it mean that they 
uh, could have filled out a FAFSA if they wanted to, but just didn't bother? Um, does it mean that they, you know, got an effective, uh, an expected family contribution calculated uh, by the system or not? Um, the one thing it did clearly do is exclude, there's a other federal law that, ex that prevents us from providing uh, direct financial support uh, using federal funds to undocumented students. Uh, although the original reading uh, in, in 2020 was to be even more exclusive of, um, like not only did you have to be, you couldn't pay to undocumented students, but uh, they had to, we had to go through an attestation process for students who had not filled out a, um, uh, a FAFSA. So there were relatively tight rules in here for one. Here for two, they significantly relaxed the rules both for student financial assistance and for institutional purposes. Here for two, it was not 50-50. It was, um, uh, we had to spend the same amount that we'd spent on here for one for student financial assistance, again, for, for student financial assistance in here for two. Uh, just FYI, um, we are currently in the process of sending out student financial assistance across CSEU. I know Central uh, went a couple days ago, Southern went yesterday. Um, I'm expecting a report back from Western and Eastern who are going any day now, and we're gonna be sending it out to the community college students starting uh, on Monday. So that's all in the works. Uh, that ends up being about $28 million worth of the here two money is going for student financial assistance. Uh, I will point out that the total amount of here two is $108 million. That's 40 million for the C 42 for the CSUs uh, and about 65 for the community colleges and about a quarter of a million for the Charter Oak State College. Uh, here three, which again, just became available has generally the same rules as here two, uh, although there are a couple of important changes um, well, I'm not sure whether they're important. They may be important. They, uh, there was one allowable use under HERF 2 that was removed from HERF 3 in order for the HERF, for the uh, American Rescue Plan Act to comply with the BIRD rule, which has to do with the use of, of um, the budget reconciliation process to pass the bill. Uh, so there was a whole piece related to the Higher Education Act that was excluded. I'm not quite sure yet whether that's going to be a problem for us or not, but we'll we're, we're continuing to try and figure that out. Uh, the, um, the here three money amounts to $190 million for the, for the CSU system. That's 75 for the universities, about 115 for the colleges and about half a million for Charter Oak State College. Um, so that, that's the total, the here for one, two and three, the total amount is about $350 million. So just over that. Um, for, uh, uh, for the total award. I will point out that the numbers I just gave you for here for three are estimates. There has not been a f uh, a, an official allocation of funds from the US Department of Education, although I expect it any day uh, for them to notify us formally of the amounts that we're eligible to receive. Um, so uh, I've, the, the general approach that we're taking uh, is, um, well, for here for one, we've gave out the financial assistance. Uh, the universities used their institutional aid to partially re uh, uh, reimburse themselves for refunds that were offered last spring when students had to move out unexpectedly from dormitories. Uh, the, the colleges are, um, have not yet, uh, we're actually planning to draw down uh, to reimburse ourselves for um, some expenses incurred last fall uh, over the next several weeks within the colleges in order to fully utilize the, um, uh, the CARES Act, here for one money. Uh, we, hung, we waited because we believe that with the new administration, there may be a loosening of some of the rules. Uh, that didn't turn out, did turn out to be the case. Uh, and so we are, um, we are planning to draw down the remaining CARES Act money for the colleges. Uh, very soon, and, and that will be fully expended. Uh, the here of two funds, uh, our approach is to uh, draw down both at the universities and the colleges as much of the student, well, the student financial assistance we're giving out now. Uh, there's a minimum required amount. Um, we're giving out that minimum, actually, in I think all cases, slightly over that minimum uh, so that we can be sure we've complied with that requirement now. That's just being sent out in 
needs-based uh, payments to students. Uh, typically at the, at the universities, they're paying out a two, two, um, two dollar amounts, one amount for students who are on, who are on Pell and one amount for students who are not. Um, I think they're prorating for part-time students. At the colleges, we are um, gonna use a three levels of payment. So the highest level of payment will go to students who are, um, uh, who are not only Pell eligible, but have a zero EFC. So the poorest, our poorest students um, will receive the highest grants. It varies at each institution because we're having to, you know, each, each institution got its own um, amount, uh, but those highest grants will range, uh, will be a, uh, around $900 or $950, in some cases over $1,000 per student. Uh, then there will be a, a step down amount for students who are Pell eligible, but, but have an EFC above zero. Those students will get about six or seven hundred dollars each, and then the students who are not Pell eligible will receive a grant um, between seventy-five and hundred dollars each. Uh, so we have highly uh, directed those funds toward our to the students with the greatest financial need uh, in the colleges. Uh, so that's all going to be expended uh, shortly uh, for the institutional portion of the of the here of two. Um, it is the strategy of both the universities and the colleges to, um, or all the, I, I don't mean to say both the universities as though there too, for all the universities and the colleges to draw down as much as possible this spring uh, to offset our, our, our losses in the current fiscal year. So we're allowed to draw it down for lost revenue, uh, although the federal government hasn't told us how to calculate that or what exactly that means yet. So we're waiting for uh, uh, formal guidance from them on how to do that. Uh, there are also, um, you know, we're looking at other categories that we will be able to uh, support um, this spring. And hopefully we can draw down the, those funds to reimburse ourselves for either lost revenue or expenses related, uh, eligible expenses that we've incurred. And so that will have the effect of uh, uh, fortifying our reserve levels at both the colleges and the universities. Um, it's my hope that the universities will be able to draw down um, uh, the total amount of those uh, here funds that they, um, let's see, the university amounts for institutional aid um, is going to amount to about $30 million just under. Um, it's my hope that they will be able to draw down most, if not all of those funds before June 30th in order to have those um, uh, shore up the reserves of the, of the universities, which have taken a hit as a result of the drops in revenue uh, experience this year. Unfortunately, one of the features of the HERF II law is that we can only use it to reimburse ourselves for expenses or lost revenue incurred after the date of enactment. Um, and a lot of our revenue loss was in the fall. Uh, and that revenue loss is sort of orphaned. There's no federal program that allows us to, uh, to reimburse for, federal, for revenue loss in the fall. Um, so we're gonna have to eat that, but hopefully we're, we're gonna be able to get uh, significant reimbursements for not only revenue loss, but expenses this spring uh, to partially make up for that fact. Uh, and I believe we will, um, that in combination with all the other state assistance we've received with testing and other COVID related expenses this year will allow the universities to um, end the year with, without, uh, uh, at the end of the day, without drawing down uh, on our reserves uh, and maybe even to add to the reserves slightly, uh, although that's, I'm not, it's not, that's not, that's, that's, uh, it's an open question whether we get to exactly to zero or slightly above it uh, by the end of the year. Uh, the colleges are taking the same approach, uh, trying to draw down, we're developing plans as soon as we get the guidance later this spring, we will be drawing down as much as we can uh, this, um, uh, this spring in the colleges. We don't think that that amount will be as large uh, and the institutional aid amounts for the colleges under here to uh, amount to $51 million. So we're anticipating drawing down between, I don't know, uh, eight and $20 million for lost revenue and other expenses reimbursing ourselves this spring. We are also um, have notified uh, all the campuses that we are 
Um, we're setting aside about $10 million of that institutional aid program for uh, campus uh, developed initiatives for uh, improve, you know, for addressing the, the problems students face as a result of the pandemic. So I ex expect we're gonna see a, see a whole series of locally de developed student support initiatives um, uh, that will be uh, uh, implemented this spring and in, in, into the summer. Uh, and hopefully we'll uh, help students uh, recover as quickly as we can. Uh, we've also identified um, funds for IT projects that we're gonna be doing. So one of the areas we'd like to do in the colleges is to uh, continue to um, add more uh, high flex capacity. This is where the classrooms are outfitted to be able to do live capture of classroom activities and lectures for um, for remote participation. Um, we have limited numbers of classrooms that are able to do that now uh, and that that um, uh, has been uh, a success and we think it's gonna be uh, a, a, a major part of our offerings going forward and we'd like to, we would like to, uh, uh, to expand that capacity. Uh, there are some other um, uh, technology and training related um, uh, activities uh, that we would um, implement on a system-wide basis now using those here for institutional funds. And then depending on how much we're able to draw down for expenses this year, we anticipate uh, between 20 and $30 million of the here two funds being available for us in the fall. Um, and we uh, expect that that will be divided between student financial assistance and institutional supports um, if necessary. Uh, one of the priorities for the college leadership has been um, uh, using, um, uh, uh, trying to identify ways to use student financial assistance funds to eliminate um, student receivables. During the pandemic, we have been much more tolerant of students uh, continuing to enroll and attend classes if they owe us money. We have allowed them to enter into payment plans that are much longer and with much more favorable terms. Uh, and, and, and because of the pandemic has been caused uh, financial problems for so many of our students, our student receivables have gone up uh, in ways that are uh, uh, a problem for us to now deal with. Uh, it has long been uh, observed by folks in the community colleges that students who owe us money uh, can't come back uh, until they pay us off. We, that's been the long time practice of the colleges is to require students to pay up for prior uh, uh, bills before they can register for a new semester. This is a major impediment to enrollment. Um, and we think that will be especially true going forward. So I anticipate that this summer we will be um, trying to find a, a way once we see the guidance from the federal government again, uh, to structure a program to provide a, a relief to those students so that we can get as many of them back uh, and enrolled in uh, courses in the fall as possible. We are also looking at um, uh, uh, some other major areas of student supports around um, student supports and, and uh, staff development. We're looking at faculty uh, uh, training uh, opportunities to brought to at, at a broad scale for the fall. And we're also looking at um, mental health interventions uh, that we can put in place uh, at scale across the system uh, to support it. It's unclear whether that will be something that we're able to fund out of the HIRF 2 or if that will become something that we fund out of HIRF 3, which again is another even larger uh, uh, source of funds that's becoming available. Um, final thing that I'll note, because HIRF 3 is really still in planning for us. So in addition to looking at staff development and um, mental health and other student support services, uh, we're also looking at um, our guided pathways program. As you may know, our current plan had been, uh, or still is, we're thinking about changing it, but our current plan is to roll guided pathways out over uh, three years. And that's one of the subsequent questions we'll talk about in a minute. Uh, we are looking at whether we can use the here money, uh, here three money, uh, to uh, significantly um, speed that implementation up uh, and implement guided pathways all at once uh, as quickly as we can um, for the upcoming uh, academic year. Uh, that creates a whole bunch of challenges, finding the right people and getting them on board and getting them trained and, uh, and continuing um, 
uh, to work on the curriculum realignments that are part of guided pathways. But um, we think we can uh, begin to see some of the enrollment benefits of guided pathways much more quickly if we um, are able to um, implement the, uh, um, uh, the advising, um, uh, advising components of guided pathways more quickly. So those are some of the things we're thinking about for here three. I don't have the information I've provided to um, staff uh, about here for one and two is relatively detailed. Here for three, we're not yet in a position to uh, to do that. We're still in discussion with uh, campus leaders and the board of regents about uh, exactly how to prioritize those funds going forward. But uh, I think the the items I've described to you are um, are the, the the those items that are in active discussion now. Um, thank you. Your your answer uh, was. <laughs> Uh, thankfully, very, very complete. I appreciate that. You know, you, the, the answer, the answer on the page was only half a page, um, but uh, I'm, but I'm glad that 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 was really time well spent, at least for me. I hope it was for other members of the committee as well. Um, just one, you know, short follow up, which is, you know, I, I tried to keep notes as best I can about the different uh, tranches of money that have come in um, and the allocation between uh, the colleges versus the state universities. Um, if you could put, I, I, I really ask for follow-ups to follow-ups, but if you could just put that into a chart for me, that would be very, very helpful. No, I'm, I'm sorry, there was a chart provided and it was provided oh. to staff uh, this morning. Uh, so I'll make sure that that gets to the full committee. Yeah. Um, there's a there's a table that has all the amounts for at least for here for one and two. Uh, so right. we'll, we'll provide, I'll make sure that that gets to the committee as well. That Thanks. my, that, my that, other side of getting it that, that would be That would be very helpful from my perspective. Um, um, and um, you know, it's, I guess it's kind of disappointing to hear that um, you know, here too was so restricted in terms of the you know the the way that you could spend it. I, I hear you when you say that at least at the state universities, you know, the the first tranche was used for housing refunds. That was money that was already uh, provided to the university, but that you know you know, folks were um, you know when when you emptied out the dormitories, it sort of became a sort of a fact of life to have to refund um, millions of dollars to students uh, yeah. for the housing costs. Of course, the housing didn't go away, uh, nor in this case did really much of the staffing costs to maintain that housing didn't go away. And so nonetheless, so it's a huge loss of revenue that was returned to students. And so here for one was used for that. But as you say, you know, the, the, there was a similar reduction in the fall um, as you thinned out the dormitories to meet public health guidelines, um, and yet um, you couldn't you couldn't recover that loss of revenue through year two. No, not for the fall. Unfortunately, not for the fall. Um, I, I, I just want to go back to last year in fiscal twenty. The here one money that we used to pay for those refunds covered about 12 out of $25 million, more or less. Mm -hmm. The remaining amount was actually covered by the coronavirus relief fund uh, through the state of Connecticut later on in the year. So um, we were ultimately able to recoup all of those refunds uh, mm -hmm. uh, through those uh, two, two funding sources. Yeah, no, there, it, is, it is a source of frustration um, uh, amongst my colleagues nationally that the the um, uh, uh, the the, the the timing limitations for here two funds, and even though interestingly with for the community colleges this has come up quite a bit, the um, here two the law the CRISPR law that adopted here two allowed you to then use the the new expanded rules that applied to here two for any un unspent here one money. Uh, with the exception of the timing. So you could, like, I, I thought, oh, great, now I can use the here, I can reclaim lost revenue from the fall in the colleges, but we're not allowed to do that. Where the lost revenue in the fall has been um, orphaned, so to speak, is uh, just a problem that we uh, will have to deal with other ways. Uh, but we do expect to be able to um, uh, recover a fair amount of our lost revenue for this spring. Uh, um, we're just still waiting to get some rules from them about accounting. One of the problems is that we, uh, on a cash basis, most of our revenue comes in in the fall um, because the due date for tuition for the spring semester is in mid to late December. 
Uh, and so uh, we have to wait and find out whether the deadline for expenses under HERF 2 allows us to uh, take funding that was paid prior to the deadline, but which applies to instruction provided after the deadline. We're still waiting for them to give us a clear guidance there. I, I, the one thing I am certain I don't want to do is to have to give any of the money back to the federal government down the road because of a failure to, um, uh, uh, to draw the, the funds down properly in accordance with their rules. Thank you. I see uh, Representative Hall has her hand up. Representative Hall, you had a question. Yeah, and I'm, I'm hoping that um, Ben won't kill me for asking for another chart, but <laughs> I'm going to ask. Um, I, too, kind of want to echo what uh, Representative Haddad said. There are so many balls in the air with the federal money and the state coronavirus reimbursements. Is there a simplistic like a small chart that can be put together to reflect the losses to the colleges and universities and then show the federal dollars that have come in along with the state dollars um, just so we can kind of see it in one simple snapshot. And I know simple has nothing to do with all this federal aid because it's super complicated. You, you just kind of laid that out on the restrictions and the guidelines on the spending. But if you could put a really simple chart together on all the losses for the universities, all the losses, and of course, due to the coronavirus to the colleges, and then the money that's come in from the feds and the state um, to try to offset some of those losses. I mean, I think it would be really, it would simplify things. I know for me personally, it's-, it's We have charts that I believe answer the questions you're looking for. Okay. The, the part about the losses is very difficult to, to, to determine because, you know, the fact that fewer students showed up, uh, who knows how many would have showed up if there hadn't been a, a pandemic. Uh, right. So it's difficult for us to put a, a, a very specific number there, uh, but I will certainly be able to um, identify all the funds we've received from directly under the HERE program, as well as the funds that we've received under the Coronavirus Relief Fund and the Governor's Education Relief Fund uh, so far. Uh, there, I need to update that because we've actually received some additional commitments of Coronavirus Relief Fund uh, for the current calendar year uh, from OPM recently. And I wanna, I, I, I have, um, uh, I will always uh, uh, remind any listener that we're very appreciative of the willingness of the state to help us cover our, our direct costs under the coronavirus and that is ongoing. Uh, so I will, uh, I will make sure that is fully up to date and share it with the committee uh, in the next day or so. And that would be great. And just uh, including the, reimbursements back to your reserves funds that you talked about too, Ben, maybe you could add that to the chart as well. Um, the, the other question, and, and I'm jumping back to the very first question, I'm sorry, um, I should have asked it, but we touched a little bit on the, um, the free college tuition program for out of state residents. And I, I know Representative Haddad said that's probably very limited. Um, it certainly would be pertinent to, to our community college here being a border town. Can we get some numbers on how much of the free college tuition program goes towards out of state students? None. None. They're, they're, they're excluded. You have okay. to be that's what I that's what I was a little confused at because I heard there can't be that many. Um, and I don't recall us saying that we were gonna use it for out-of-state tuition. So um, Paul, I think what I was referring to is that um, yeah, in the response they gave, there was a there was um, a dollar figure given for all other tuition received by the community college system. Okay, gotcha. Um, and, I, and, I was, and I was trying to point out, well, that's an, that's an interesting number and that, you know, the, the value of PACT for part-time students may approach that number. It won't reach that number because 
Um, we know there are ineligible students who also pay tuition. They're ineligible because they're pursuing a second degree. They're ineligible because they're from out of state, um, okay. et cetera, et cetera. And so while I think that some of, you know, this out of state portion might be a very small number, um, it's still it's still a number of folks that would not be would not be eligible. Yeah, and I, I realize that I know specific to as Nantuck, they, they've done heavy recruiting out of state um, because it's really helped them in that particular college because of it being a border town. So I appreciate the clarification. That was a little confusing to me because I thought that we had strictly reflected in-state uh, students for that money. So thank you. Great. And there are students, I, the there are thousands of students who live out of state who attend community college in Connecticut. Many of them are, are in exactly as you described in these border, border institutions. And they, we provide uh, waivers for adjoining state. I mean, our, uh, we have a pilot program that provides in-state tuition for um, you know, adjoining state residents uh, who go to you know, as Nuntuck or Three Rivers or whichever college it is. Uh, and they, but they're not eligible for PACT um, uh, okay. or for, um, I don't, I'm not sure they're, in, I don't think they're eligible for institutional aid in the colleges either. I don't think okay. we can institutional aid to out of, student, out of state students. Great. I appreciate that. I know a lot of the universities and colleges in Massachusetts uh, do the same for bordering uh, towns in Connecticut to their colleges as well. So thank you for that. You're welcome. Yeah, um, one last point on PACT, and then I'll get back to the, um, the CARES money, et cetera. Um, and that is, um, you, you know, in your answer, you 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 talked about the the cost of providing um, additional scholarships. Um, we had when we originally uh, conceived of this plan, there were some uh, indications that when you offer a free college program that you leverage some federal dollars because students who may not otherwise attend the community college go with the expectation that it will be free, but they are also fully Pell eligible. And so their scholarships are really paid for by the federal government. And so you, you, you realize um, more, we, I think the original model showed that we would realize more additional tuition revenue than the PAC program itself would provide. Um, I'm wondering if the numbers that you provided us include that kind of a net uh, a difference, or if this is just the additional cost that you think that you would incur without um, uh, netting in any additional revenue that you might also incur. This is a challenging number to find because it, it we have to make assumptions about, you know, who, who is new, uh, who wouldn't have showed up if it weren't for the PACT program. Um, so we don't have any good calculation of that now. I think we would have to do some survey work to, to help us estimate that effectively. I will say that when you compare, I, I had recent cause to compare the demographics of our student body for the spring of 2021 compared to the spring of 2020 to mm -hmm. sort of and to get a sense of which groups were um, impacted most by the pandemic. And full-time students uh, did remarkably well. I mean, they were a bright, I mean, they were in a bright spot and there's not that many bright spots in our enrollment, uh, which was steeply down. Uh, but the um, enrollment among full-time students held up remarkably well. Uh, and it was amongst part-time students that we saw the biggest declines. Mm -hmm. And um, so this is a little, and it is only partially quantitative, uh, but uh, I know I and a number of my colleagues uh, uh, believe that the existence of the PAC program uh, may be responsible for the relatively strong numbers of full-time students that we, um, that we brought, uh, that we are serving this year uh, uh, in, in, in response to the pandemic. So, I mean, we're all certainly uh, very appreciative that the PAC program started up. I mean, this was not never a good year to start a new program, uh, but this was a year when we, um, you know, we're all we're, are happy about any bright spot in our enrollment picture. Uh, and um, uh, full-time students certainly was, and we, I think, attribute that uh, to PACT, uh, but I don't yet have confidence that I can 
um, really state what that looks like. I think if we have a few years of experience, we could probably do some statistical analysis that would help us to um, uh, uh, to, to be more specific about the sort of net new number of of, of Pell students who come in. I will say that the um, um, the a number of um, the amount of uh, the share of students in the PAC program who were Pell eligible, uh, because I know that because they got the minimum grant, um, was over half. So we were, I think, in the in the fifty five percent, something like that, uh, of our of the students in the PAC program were on Pell and received the minimum grant, um, which suggests to me that we. Uh, uh, certainly, we're bringing Pell students into the program, um, uh, and and a, and a normally a Pell student would not. I mean, in order to get a, a grant under the PAC program, they had to enroll pretty early. Uh, there were you know deadlines that were sooner than the normal enrollment deadlines in order to uh, avail yourself of PAC. Uh, and so, I, I'm assuming that these students came for PAC, uh, at least in some considerable numbers. Uh, uh, and turned out to be Pell eligible. So uh, I think that that, I, I, I think that number is a definite, is a real number. I just don't have a good way to estimate it right now. And just to build off uh, what Ben is saying too, I think one of the challenges uh, with the program was the uncertainty of funding. And while we did do a pretty aggressive marketing strategy at the for the fall semester, uh, you know, obviously without funding associated, you know, we had to, we couldn't be as aggressive into the spring. Uh, the, the campuses, you know, are probably, were, pretty reluctant to, I think, to heavily market a program that there was no funding associated with. Um, the, the line item that's in the governor's proposal, I think, is going to be a, a big help of providing that certainty and that assurance that there is funding there for the program into the future that will give our folks uh, the comfort to, to really lean in on that, the marketing for that and, and the outreach. So I, I, you know, should that move into the, the final budget that passes the General Assembly and there, there is that uh, line item of funding for PAC moving forward, um, you know, I, I think the real tests for PAC and that enrollment bump that you may see from it and the new Pell dollars that could be brought in will, will be seen, you know, once we have a, a, a stable, a stably funded program that we can, you know, assuredly market. Okay, uh, so thank you. So getting back on track, we're, we're completing the answer to four, item number four. Um, just as a time check, we're about a, an app, we're about halfway through the time that we have allotted, uh, but we're only a third of the way through the questions. Um, and so um, I, I think the last you know, question, the answer to question four took you know uh, some time, but that was worth the, the wait. Um, uh, question number five is around guided pathways. Uh, we started talking about them, but this is an initiative that helps ensure both persistence and completion. Of, of, uh, of students, right? And um, you talked about uh, ramping up potentially with her funds, um, the implementation date for uh, the rollout of the of guided pathways. Is there anything else that you want to add or is there any other, um, you know, there's, there's more information on the page here. No. Yeah, I mean, we provided the original uh, rollout plan. Obviously, if we compress that, you can, you, it's relatively easy to imagine how, what that would look like and we'll, and we'll provide um, if we, when we do that, we'll certainly let you know. Um, Carrie's here; she's much more knowledgeable about the finances of the program as it's currently being implemented. So we'll be happy to take any questions about it. Yeah, I think of particular interest to me actually is is just the you know the your uh, one one um, metric would be your 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 student counselor ratios, right? Which um, you know, have been a point of concern uh, by members of the General Assembly, and I know in your your own system as well. And so this this seeks to um, rectify that situation as we're implementing a system that helps to direct um, students uh, into into programs that work and are of value too, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, I, we're we're very hope. I mean, that that's relatively straightforward. To I mean, you need money to hire. Um, yeah. And you need to, you know, put in place a system for them to all work within, and we're we're working on all that now. Uh, there's obviously the other component that in, involves establishment of those pathways um, uh, through the curriculum, 
uh, which involves uh, curriculum realignment. That process is also ongoing, uh, and we're happy to speak to either of those or folks on the phone on the call today who can uh, answer speak to both of those moving forward. Do any committee members have any additional questions about guided pathways that they want to ask now? Seeing none. Um, Representative Haddad, yes. may I just add one additional piece of this really very important information? Guided yes. Pathway also advances equity for our first generation and our minority students and those who come from economically disadvantaged communities. This is huge. Thank you. Yeah, and and, uh, and we know that, especially coming out of the pandemic, um, you know, these are communities that have been particularly hard hit, and that's why we see the decline in enrollment at community college in particular. Um, this gets a little bit at uh, the previous question that I was asking about as well, about what the impact is of PACT on full-time uh, enrollment, uh, et cetera. Um, we know that um, minority, low-income, first-time student families in particular, were hit very hard by uh, the pandemic, and we know that uh, you know the, the National Student Clearinghouse reports that that impact might be as high as 30 percent um, of students who uh, decline in enrollment, uh, matriculation from high school uh, into college. And so, um, one of the one of my I'm not going to ask today, but one of the questions that I have been um, sort of popping up in a question mark over my head for a couple of weeks now is how do we um, how do we take what was a disastrous year for people who graduated in the class of 2020 um, and who did not matriculate into college and go back and find them and, um, and, and get them back on the path? Um, and I, you know, that's, that's a question of enrollment um, and marketing, I suppose, to some extent. Um, I actually happen to run a nonprofit that has a program that helps kids matriculate into college from the Harvard Public School System. And I can say that in our own uh, program statistics, we saw a 30% decline in our matriculation rate between 2019 and 2020. So we know that this is a real, a real issue and, and there's a human face behind them that we're not talking about today, but they are real students who would have gone to college if it weren't for the pandemic, but who did not. So I, I think it, you know, the equity issue, I think is real and one that we really need to stay focused on. I appreciate your, your comments, Dr. Gates. Um, Question number, I'm sorry, I see Representative Turco's hand is up. Representative Turco. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just um, a question in regards to guided pathways here. What else does it entail besides the hiring of the additional staff who then are gonna provide this in-depth counseling of the student uh, through the completion of their degree? Are, are there other other sort of uh, components to it that the funding is needed for? I wanna just get a better understanding of that. And then my second question is, when do you anticipate for all of the hiring to be done and for the program to be fully implemented so we can get to that, get down to that 250 to one uh, staff to student ratio? Thank you. Sure, Representative Turco. I'm Carrie Kelly, um, and I'm happy to answer your question. Uh, we've begun to implement phase one in the current fiscal year. We've hired three regional advising directors, and we'll be hiring 32 additional staff this fiscal year uh, because we're hiring them so late in the year. The costs are low, but they annualize to about 2.25 million plus fringe benefits. Our plan originally was to phase in uh, guided pathways, adding it to more campuses, over the next two years. So phase two would bring on 46 advisors on 40 on four campuses. That would cost 2.8 million plus fringe. And then the final phase would have been in uh, FY23, and that would bring on 85 staff at five campuses with a fully annualized cost of $5.1 million plus fringe. Um, there's a one-time cost for technology to buy computers for these folks. Uh, but I think one of the other challenges we're gonna face is putting them uh, physically on the campuses. There might be some minor uh, capital costs to reconfigure some space to allow it to be very student facing so that students can access that. So that's one of the challenges we'll have to uh, consider as we think about accelerating the implementation of guided pathways. 
Harry, if I could just add one item as well. Um, as we bring on the staff, we are looking to expand our existing functionality with our student information system to make sure that advisors in a distributed environment are able to both communicate with their students and to communicate with each other and sort of the, the guided pathway advisors are a hub, but communicating student needs across the campus more efficiently. So we have launched that work as well. And I, I probably should also mention that all of these hires, which would be about 170 over three years, uh, they would all be bargaining unit members. Thank you. And all of these hires will be located within the individual colleges, right? Not in the system office? Correct. Okay, and so we're, we're still on pace for uh, by 2023 for all of these hires to take place despite the difficulties of the pandemic? We certainly are on pace to implement phase one. I mean, as you know, there's significant costs and per perhaps tier of three will allow us to fund phases two and three, but there are significant costs and uh, we'll have to figure out how to fund those moving forward, but that's our goal. Uh, to implement students first to have these folks in place by FY23. Anything to accelerate that would be great. Okay, thank you so much uh, for those responses. Really appreciate it. Uh, one, one last question, I guess, around this, and that is, um, you know, it's interesting that you mentioned that, that her funds might be uh, utilized to advance the time frame for this. You know, during the public hearing, I think that we had talked a little bit about using the possibility of using her funds uh, to fund allocations for the PACT program. Um, and my recollection, which might be faulty, was that um, there was some caution uh, 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 sort of expressed about investing her funds into a program um, that already existed. Um, uh, and that, it, that you know, we, can't, we can't use her funds to supplant expenditures that have already been, uh, I guess, anticipated or planned. How is that argument applied to uh, the pact, if I have that argument correct, but not to the uh, not not to this initiative on, on guided pathways and hiring new staff? I think that the concern about using it for pact is a little different than you described. We actually are allowed, at least with HERF two and three, to reimburse ourselves for existing programs um, in provided that they are associated with the coronavirus, which is um, pretty general. Everything seems to be associated with the coronavirus these days. Um, the concern with using HIRF money for PAC is the requirement that student financial assistance uh, funded by HIRF be, and I think the phrase is, um, prioritize students with exceptional need. Um, and uh, the PAC program is not needs-based. So uh, we uh, are concerned that using the funds for that program uh, would be uh, would not qualify and would be uh, would be problematic uh, in the in the scheme of things. Now that said, um, uh, there certainly is need within the PAC program. I mean, PAC is sort of need blind. Uh, so there might be some way that we uh, 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 we certainly are going to be using a, a have already and will continue to use more of the HIRF money for student financial assistance, uh, and that may um, uh, may impact the PAC program. But I think that uh, for us to directly identify the PAC program as the uh, as the use of the funds would be problematic with the the, the requirement that it be needs based. Uh, there is, um, we believe generally that the guided pathways program. Uh, given that it would be, uh, uh, we think, extremely effective at helping students who were um, uh, adversely impacted by the pandemic and stayed in school or those who were impacted by the pandemic and either dropped out or didn't just elected to postpone going to college entirely uh, because of the utility of the Guided Pathways Program and, and advisement generally to um, helping those students get back in and be successful in, in college. We thought it was a, um, we, think it, we think that that is a, a, an eligible use. Obviously, we're gonna continue to look at that and, 
and we may get more, you know, every day I go to the federal website to see if they put any more guidance or any more FAQs up to explain some of the nuances of the law that may, uh, uh, we, so our, our determination may change with new information, but right now we think that the substance of the guided pathways program um, would, uh, would assist us um, in meeting the needs of students impacted by the pandemic. And so starting that up more quickly uh, using federal funds would be an allowable use. Uh, I'd like to add that uh, based on our analysis that we prepared for the Higher Education Consolidation Committee uh, last week, uh, by implementing guided pathways, we believe that we'll have increased enrollment through retention uh, as students receive better advising. So that's a key component of Students First. And in our analysis, uh, when we were anticipating phasing in guided pathways over a three-year period, we would have a net benefit to the bottom line that exceeded the cost by FY24. Uh, so in FY24, we had anticipated $19.2 million in additional revenue through retention, uh, whereas by 24, the cost, including fringe benefits, annualized out for all of those uh, three phases would be 18.35. So uh, this is a, a good uh use of potential HERA funding as it would not be recurring costs into the future because we would now have a, a revenue source that would offset that. So what additional thought? Um, even if it wasn't related to my question, that's, I'm, I'm glad to hear that analysis around the net cost of the guided pathways. Um, you know, it, it, it stands to reason given what retention rates are in community colleges, um, that if we can boost retention rates that fills seats with, um, you know, tuition dollars from whatever source um, for your system. So that makes good sense. And, it, and you know, the, the, the marketing strategy is it's always easier to keep the, the customer that you've already attracted rather than try to find a new one, right? So um, I, I strongly support that. And that, that's aside from the value of, to the students themselves who will hopefully just complete at a, at a far greater rate. Uh, Representative Hall, you had a question. Yeah, I, I'm going to apologize for jumping back and forth again. Um, my question is, have we reached out to our federal partners um, specifically to the debt-free college program to find out if we can use those federal dollars to aid us in this program? I mean, I know we're keeping an eye on the guidelines, but I mean, has anybody reached out and said, you know, is this a possibility to use these dollars to add to this program that was already underway when the pandemic hit? We have not yet done that, um, but we're also aware that the U.S. Department of Education has been promising to provide a large amount of additional guidance around the HERE 2 and HERE 3 funds uh, this spring. Uh, and so I think we, um, uh, I know that there are other questions that have been asked by our colleagues in other states and in national associations uh, months ago that have only very recently been answered. So we're trying to be patient, uh, but we will eventually um, be seeking guidance on specific programs uh, as we get a little closer. Um, I, I don't know, um, I, you know, I, I, I'll, I'm trying to think how to say this in a, in a nice way. The Board of Regents may, I don't know what their priorities yet are going to be for, uh, for that and whether, um, I mean, from their perspective, they may feel as though the, um, you know, the state in, in, in enacted this program and we've been supportive of it, but uh, we would like the state to fund it and we would like to fund other programs as well. Uh, it's my view that we should be, um, I would prefer that the PAC program be funded by the state and that we find other ways to help students financially uh, with a mind, with an eye ultimately toward uh, getting as close to free college for as many students as possible. Um, I mean, the PAC right. program is providing free college for a bunch of students, but uh, I would rather use uh, the funds that, that have been given to the system by the federal government to provide free college to yet other groups of students as well, uh, and to try to really broaden affordability as much as possible. 
Right. So we're, um, we're I, not I, bother do it that way. <laughs> yeah, no, I understand where you're going with that, but then, and I, I think when, when, of course, we discussed debt-free college, we were looking at numbers that I felt at the time were totally way low, um, and it turns out obviously they were. So um, that that kind of just covers the, the direction I was going with that question, and I appreciate your answer. I do understand what where you're uh, what you're you were trying to tread lightly on there. So thank you. I will add for that, you know, we haven't, while well, we haven't reached out to the Federal Department of Education for flexibility on currently allocated funds, we're waiting to see their guidance on that. You know, we are constantly having conversations with our federal delegation, in particular, you know, Representative DeLauro's office uh, on conversations about any particular uh, potential future legislation and the need for flexibility, both for institutional uh, aid and for direct aid to students. Uh, and just we've given them examples of some of the, the challenges that we've had in awarding those funds based on the current restrictions in, in HERP 1, HERP 2, and that moving forward where we might need some additional flexibility. So those are ongoing conversations that, you know, they're at least aware of, you know, some of our requests. And I know our partners at UConn and uh, CCIC institutions have had similar conversations. Um, so they're aware of the needs of, of higher education and, and additional flexibility and new funds moving forward. But some of that challenge, you know, I think as, as Ben expressed is, is baked into the, uh, the old, uh, old pots of money from HERP 1 and HERP 2, so. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, let's move on to question six, which I think is a quick answer. And then uh, <laughs> I, I'm mindful of the time, we only have about a half an hour, a little over half an hour left and there's some, um, uh, you know, once you get to page eight, the type gets much smaller. So well, let's, let's uh, stick to the question, well, I think generally about, about what, 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 what adjustments would need to your, would we need to make your block grants to avoid future deficits? Well, um, and these, it's, it is a difficult thing to answer right now because of the, the complexity of the federal money and also the, the complexity of knowing how long our current, uh, the enrollment slump we've enjoyed this enjoyed that we've experienced this year, how long that will last and whether we will bounce right back or we'll bounce back over a few years. Um, the numbers that we've provided are projections based on our, um, you know, our, our, our best ability to uh, look out into the future. Um, uh, these assume uh, in both cases of the colleges and the universities that we will restore our revenue levels gradually over two or three years back to the pre-pandemic levels uh, and that we will continue to, you know, have our costs be what they are now, um, you know, subject to uh, 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 continued, um, you know, changes in, in underlying conditions, inflation and the like. So um, you can see that the uh, colleges, um, uh, we think that we ultimately have, uh, uh, will come back to a um, recurring deficit of, of about $20 million. Uh, it will be a little bit less. Uh, it's a little less than 21 um, uh, because of we've already applied some finance, state federal financial assistance and other things to that. Uh, we've been able to um, save some money during the pandemic because of the reduced operations uh, on ground, which saves us a little bit of money. Uh, and then in fiscal 22 and 23, you can see the 14 and $22 million uh, that we think we're gonna be short, not counting federal funds. Again, federal funds could, uh, uh, could cut into that depending on how we're able to use those. Uh, the universities, I think, have a somewhat more um, uh, significant uh, uh, problem uh, that they, uh, we see their shortfall as, uh, growing uh, and being at about $30 million, $36 million this year and growing gradually uh, into the future. Uh, again, um, uh, there's a lot of assumptions built into that around how quickly we, we recover our, you know, on-campus uh, students, how quickly we recover our enrollment levels uh, and what our future expenses are. Obviously, one factor that is not reflected in any of this is the potential for um, 
uh, uh, collective bargaining settlements to, to uh, I mean, I'm sure that they will be, we will resolve our outstanding collective bargaining agreements for, uh, for the upcoming biennium. Uh, and we have not built in costs for those because we don't, um, uh, we don't know what those are. And uh, uh, since we had to make an assumption, we just made an assumption that we will not consider those. I will tell you that the uh, collective bargaining agreements uh, that we're currently under, the years in which um, the five and a half percent was given out, or three and a half percent plus step, um, amounted to about $9 million in a year in additional costs in for each year of increase at the community colleges and about $12 million in the universities. So the, um, you know, you get a sense of the scale of what a collective bargaining agreement might add to those potential deficits. And, you know, I'd, I'd just like to add that the estimates for the community colleges presume that the 20.35 million that we enjoy uh, and receive this year and other funds fringe benefit support is restored. So as you know, in the current year, we received a total of 36.5 million under two different authorizations. And so uh, moving forward for the upcoming biennium, only 16.2 of that is uh, continuing under the governor's recommended budget. Um, the 20.35 that we've been receiving in the current year is not sustained in the governor's recommended. So um, those estimates of the deficit for the community colleges would be increased by 20.35 if the fringe benefit support for other funds is not restored for the biennium. I don't see any hands up in terms of uh, additional questions on this. And so we'll move on to question seven. Um, I'm, I'm going to expedite question seven by saying it looks like it's just a request for information. Um, this is your request as you submitted it to OPM. Members can look at that themselves. And if they want to, they can compare it to the governor's proposal and see any differences. Um, Question number eight is about um, at handling projected declines in reserves. Um, you know, a number of the institutions, I think half of the colleges um, have negative reserves. Um, uh, so this probably merits a, a, some uh, uh, discussion. Uh, did you wanna go through the answer? Well, sure, I'll be very brief. Um, we do have about, well, one of the universities and six of the colleges have negative reserves. Um, uh, this is concerning, obviously, uh, but I think is um, uh, manageable for now uh, through the, I mean, the, the accreditation process, as you know, the standard seven under NACHI requires that, I um, can't remember exactly how they phrase it, but there is a requirement that you have uh, uh, sufficient reserves to ensure flexibility, ability to meet un un unanticipated expenses and the like. Um, we have been able to satisfy that standard, uh, apparently to the satisfaction of NETSHE uh, in the colleges by pointing to um, the fact that those reserves are pooled and that there are significant reserves available uh, that, that are um, uh, a significant portion of reserves are identified as being system reserves, which uh, the Board of Regents could use to meet unanticipated expenses at any of the colleges, even those with negative uh, uh, unrestricted net proceeds. So we are, um, uh, uh, we, I believe, uh, are able to meet the standard now. Uh, we clearly do meet the standard now, uh, and we'll be able to uh, in the foreseeable future However, um, it's not ideal uh, for, for this to be the case. And we are um, in the colleges, one of the real fundamental problems is that the, uh, I don't believe that the uh, um, way that we distribute state assistance to the colleges um, fully recognizes the differences in their cost structure and needs. Uh, so you see the, you know, two of the biggest negative reserve levels are gateway and capital. Um, gateway and capital, uh, uh, one of the reasons for this is that they're downtown urban locations. Uh, they, they need to rent parking for their students and faculty. They need to uh, provide much higher levels of staffing to support the facilities in an urban location 
uh, you know, they have to maintain more contracts for elevator maintenance and actually escalators in the case of, uh, uh, of capital. Uh, there are significant costs associated with that. Uh, they also, um, just with the physical plant, uh, with the student body um, in, in some of these, uh, and some of our urban campuses have uh, greater needs. They, um, the, many of the students come from uh, K-12 districts that, have, uh, that are lower performing generally um, in terms of uh, academic success of their, of their graduates. I, um, uh, and um, uh, the socioeconomic can, status of, our, of many of the students in our urban campuses is, uh, is, um, is they're, they're poor uh, and they have um, greater academic needs as a result. So I'm not sure that the system we currently use to distribute funds uh, accurately, adequately uh, recognizes that. On the other hand, we have a long history of changing our distribution methodology amongst the campuses by consensus. Uh, and we cannot achieve consensus to redistribute funds away from everybody else uh, in order to satisfy the larger needs at our urban campuses. Uh, without causing fiscal distress to those other campuses. Uh, this is solved by um, uh, the establishment of one college under students first. Uh, and so that's the current solution that we um, would offer for, uh, for addressing that. In the case of the universities, um, Western had a major revision to their, uh, uh, to their audit financial report last year having to do with the uh, uh, way that we um, uh, treat, I think it compensated absences was a major piece of that. So we, uh, they had to take an essentially accounting write down of a number of million, million dollars. And now Western has a, a negative reserve. They are working um, and putting in place plans to turn that around. And I have great confidence that they'll be able to do so. You may recall that 10 years ago, or more or less, uh, Eastern was in negative, uh, had negative reserves, uh, and were able to uh, claw their way back uh, and, uh, you know, have surplus operations for a number of years and establish reserves. Again, with the universities, there is a system reserve uh, that is available for the board to use to support Western or any of the other schools, uh, should they need it, uh, in order to um, uh, maintain their accreditation requirements. At the end of the day, the way to rebuild reserves is to bring in more money than you put out um, uh, and to have surplus operations. It's difficult to imagine doing that right now uh, in the pandemic. And uh, right now, to the extent that we have, uh, the, if, if we could identify extra resources, I know there's enormous pressure uh, um, within both the colleges and the universities to use any additional resources available now to meet the needs of students, to meet the pandemic related needs of students. Um, but uh, we're certainly mindful of our financial condition and we'll uh, try to meet both of those objectives going forward. Um, thank you for that response. So are there any questions by members of the committee? Um, if not, then we'll go to um, uh, for a very interesting set of statistics uh, in, in, in question number nine, it, it results, I mean, these are really outcomes um, at the community college. And I don't know if anybody like, um, I'm guessing that uh, Mr. Barnes is gonna be off the hook on this one. No, he's <laughs> gonna answer this one. <laughs> okay, no, no, go no, ahead. I would defer to uh, uh, Dr. Gates or Dr. Levinson. Oh to yes, yes, sir. On some of those questions. <laughs> Right, that's what I figured. A lot of numbers, but they're not your kind of numbers. Uh, um, we, you know, there's there was some talk at the public hearing about um, outcomes at the community colleges, and I know that um, that's what uh, the Guided Pathways Initiative is intended to sort of help. Um, other initiatives that you have, I know that you mentioned um, outcomes a lot, um, but clearly, um, you know, the the, the you know, I, I think there are two things. One is that the students who go to community colleges in Connecticut. Um, face uh, likely face higher hurdles than many other students uh, do generally, um, and um, so the task is um, 
some maybe maybe a little bit greater, but also the you know there's what what is happening at the colleges and what you can do to support those students is or is more limited. And I know that you're working um, to um, to address those limitations as well. So this this offers a lot of statistics around completion rates. Um, and um, if you want to just walk us through, um, that would be appreciated. But I um, think we're probably more focused on those initiatives that you think really show promise in helping to improve the situation as well. Okay, so is Dr. Levinson on? If not, then very, uh, very well. Oh, I'm here. I'm here, Dr. If Gates. If you want to do that, would you prefer that I take that? No, I'm happy to do it. No, my pleasure. Um, you know, what we're hoping certainly through Connecticut State Community College is to address these inequities. I mean, the way I look at all the data is that when it looks at graduation or completion rates, uh, even the best of our colleges are at minimally successful levels. Um, so the issue uh, we talked about earlier about guided pathways is going to be critical so that students have a relationship to an advisor that can work with them not only academically and guide them accordingly, but also to um, elucidate other services that are community-based uh, that would respond to student needs. Uh, and certainly the pandemic has highlighted issues such as food insecurity, housing, uh, certainly employment, et cetera. And so, you know, what, what we look at here is that uh, the completion rates are, are not acceptable. Uh, the KPIs are below that what I would like to see. Um, Representative Haddad, as you said, indeed in Connecticut, we have a challenge uh, because two thirds of our students are attending part-time. Uh, we certainly believe we can leverage PACT and other programs to increase the number of full-time students and also to have a variety of different modalities of instructional delivery, uh, whether it be on ground and also online. Um, so what we, we look at really with Connecticut State, and it goes back to Ben, what he was saying earlier, is a more equitable distribution of funds uh, that would not be to 12 separate colleges, but to one, so we can deploy the monies and, and funds that we need. The other thing I would just uh, suggest, and I was on a call earlier today, um, an important part of this is also creating closer connections to K-12. to uh, We have a number of early college programs in our system. Uh, one that I started at Norwalk, Pathways of Technology High School with IBM. And what we're looking to do is to replicate that throughout the state, uh, because we really feel if there's con continuity with respect to educational pathways, we can capture more students. And the advantage with Connecticut State is that we will have the 12 campuses that are thoroughly locally based and, and are working with local school systems. But what we'd like to do is to replicate models of success with respect to early college, dual enrollment, and again, create pathways that currently don't exist and to hopefully incentivize students to stay and graduate from a community college before they continue on to a four-year institution and or the workforce. Um, so we believe strategically with the new college and the implementation of those uh, initiatives, we can really make tremendous headway. And we have on an episodic level at different colleges, different campuses, but we want to really, you know, make that uh, a whole. So those, that's my general response, but again, happy to answer any questions that anyone has. The other thing I will add, Dr. Levinson, to yours is that currently we have in place placement procedures through 2023 due to the pandemic. Students aren't able to enroll using their high school GPA. It's been extremely difficult they get standardized tests because some of it stopped, AC, whether it's ACT, uh, and also the option, uh, students do not necessarily need AccuPlacer either. High school GPA. We also implemented the pass-fail option for students. This is a very stressful time for our students in our colleges. And uh, for those students who do not major in disciplines that require the traditional letter grade, the students then can work toward the completion of a credit and not be quite as stressed out uh, in terms of uh, affecting negatively their grade point average. So those are a couple of things now. And then we're currently working on the alignment of completion of math and English with the, particularly math, 
with the area of study. And that's futuristic, that's evolving. Thank you, David, and thank you, Representative Idaho. Thank you. Thank you. Um, you know, this, I, I don't, this is obviously related to your budget and your needs as, an, as a system. Um, this, this conversation isn't sort of uh, directly related in the way that some of the other conversations have been. But one of the statistics that really sort of left off the page for me is, uh, is the last line of table two. Um, and I just wanted to just hear a quick explanation. Um, this is the percentage of students who earned zero college level credits during their first term. Um, and, it, and it looks like it's about a quarter of, um, I, don't know, I don't know if this is a quarter of the newly enrolled, I guess it's a quarter of the cohort. Um, is, is that a result of, of them um, being enrolled in non-credit bearing courses? Or is that um, an indicator of a, of, a, of a failure to pass a course? I, I couldn't tell. It probably is a combination of both, but can you? Uh, yeah, I would suggest that it is a combination of both. I mean, I, I think right now, and I had this experience when I was at Norwalk for 15 years, it's all too easy for a student to just drop out and not complete. Um, it's something that we want to uh, tackle and, and not allow our students to leave. Um, the, the, issue of attaining no credits um, is often when there is a systemic failure. And I don't mean the failure with the student as much as the institution. We're not doing the outreach that we should. We're not doing that connectivity that we need to in order not to allow this to happen. Um, and, and those are startling statistics, um, you know, because it's a, it's a waste of resources, uh, certainly a waste of time. And you know, what we're trying to do that Dr. Gage just mentioned is to implement policies that are going to you know, make it easier for students to complete, but very important to be more proactive at the uh, college level to reach out to these students and contact them and to know where they are at all times and to really engage in what I would call intrusive advising. So that's an unfortunate reflection of, of current practices, which um, what can I say are abysmal. Um, but there are more, you know, as I always talk about this with faculty and staff, it's really more structural the way in which we're, quote, doing business now. It's not because people haven't really tried their hardest, but we just don't have the mechanisms and structures in place, nor the technology to do that kind of connectivity that I believe would really make a tremendous difference in, in those figures. Right. Um, uh, I was looking to see if there was, um, I'm not sure we, we asked this specifically, but in, uh, in the information you gave me, if there's a significant difference uh, in the completion rate between students who attend full-time versus part-time. I know part of the rationale, um, well, well, the primary rationale for, for limiting the PAC program to full-time students was the availability of dollars. Uh, but, but, but another rationale was um, the completion rate uh, generally, uh, as my understanding, has been much stronger among students who attend full-time rather than part-time. Of course, baked into that, I guess, is um, an inequity in terms of people being able to attend full-time or part-time. Um, it's one of the reasons why we added the, um, the, the stipend, even for, um, uh, for students who have a, you know, very low EFCs. Um, mm -hmm. sort of help mitigate that cost, although I'm not sure the stipend that's included in PACT um, is significant enough to make a, a difference. But um, could you comment on the, the success, my, relative success rate between full-time and part-time students? Yeah, I mean, you know, basically you, you're right. You know, the part-time student is less likely to attain a degree and we can get you those figures. I'm just looking at the data that we supplied and we can certainly provide more data there. Um, but that has been our, our challenge. And I don't know if Dr. Buckley, if there's other information that uh, you might be able to interject there. Um, ha happily, thank you, President Levinson. I do think um, the national research indicates that any students who complete 30 credits in their first year, um, so a traditional 15, credits a semester or using summer and winter sessions are far more likely to ultimately receive a credential. It is a bit of a chicken and the 
chicken and the egg. Um, so many of our students are supporting families. They are working and going to school and just face tremendous burdens. So, um, you know, I, one of the things that we want to do with having, with making sure that each student has an advisor and someone they, they can go to, that they can have the conversations about what makes sense. Because students signing up for a full-time load when they are working 40 hours a week and um, have elder care or child care responsibilities are probably those students who complete zero credits, that it is too overwhelming and they stop out. So finding that balance for our students of the supports outside the classroom to be successful um, and really having a conversation on what is an appropriate credit load given the challenges outside the classroom. I think that has to be done on a case by case, student by student basis. And we don't have enough folks right now, honestly, who are able to have those discussions and advise appropriately. So, um, you know, whether it is a question when we look at those students who fail to get any credits, um, is that that they they took on more for for all the right reasons, but they just didn't have the support to to complete? Um, is it a lack of preparedness? So really understanding the student at the individual level and connecting them appropriately um, to the supports that are unique for them is uh, is a challenge for all community colleges, but one that we are eager to address. And I would add to uh, Dr. Buckley's comment there that when we look at developmental ed, the way that it's structured, so it isn't the faculty isn't giving really quality instructions, they really are, but when a student is enrolled in a developmental ed non-credit course sequentially before he or she can earn one credit, they drop out, they stop out. Those students feel that it's meaningless to even be there. So it's a really difficult thing. And that's why we are moving forward policies to say, put these students, the one, and then their students are displaced as a result of an accuplacer. We have shown there is no correlation between that score and student performance. So we have to be very, very careful about how we place our students. The high school GPA is by far the most accurate predictor. And, but we yet depend when, on a lot of standardized exams. So there, it's a very complex structure, but we need to ensure that we have policies in place that give our students the opportunity to progress and to move toward completion. And I don't know, I'm not gonna go into a long history, but having worked at an HBCU, I have seen the results uh, and then I heard someone the other day say, just this morning say that, yeah, I understand what you mean about the standardized test score because I was advised not to uh, go into higher ed or to move forward. So many of us have faced that uh, with, the, with the scores. It does not mean that the academic mindset that is grit, students believing that they can accomplish it does not impact because it does. It's the cognitive and the effective variables so we have to be careful how we construct developmental ed and displace students. Some students will never make it out. I mean, let's be realistic because they're so underprepared, but there are those who are displaced who will, when we add supplemental instruction to the credit bearing course. I'm very passionate about this representative. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. We, we, we appreciate that passion because it's um, obviously that, that we, we'd, we'd all like to see these numbers improve. Um, I, I suspect, um, as has been previously mentioned, um, uh, you know, while academic preparation might be a, a barrier for many students, um, I suspect that it's just, you know, life and life's demands um, that um, make it very difficult uh, for many students to devote the time necessary to to, to be successful in their college career. And it's, um, and so many uh, folks in our society are forced to make a short-term decision to leave college to, to, to attend to more pressing needs um, and may, may in fact never return. And so, um, you know, anytime that you wanna have a conversation with me about 
of figuring out ways to provide more supports to students um, in, uh, in, uh, to be able to uh, manage to, to, to go full time and to complete on time. Um, I mean, I'm convinced that that's probably some of the best dollars that we could spend if what we get at the end is somebody who um, is personally fulfilled, but can also fill a job in Connecticut that needs to be filled or meet an, an employer's need that needs to be met um, and go on to, you know, um, um, help the economic engine in Connecticut sort of be more robust. So uh, I, I, I'd like to have purely altruistic reasons for supporting <laughs> that, that kind of expenditure of and supports and supports, but um, but, I, but I'll say that I think that there's a strong, strong argument just on a return of an investment yes. um, um, argument to be made that, um, that, that that would be the right thing to do for our state as well. Are there so any Representative, reasons? if yes. I could just add very Please, quickly ahead. on, um, and I think the living wage is so critical, but I, I did want to share, um, and Ben had talked earlier about the students that we lost. We, we are in the process of doing an outreach campaign to our students who stopped out during the pandemic. Um, and first and foremost, understanding why. Um, was it uh, multi-generational households and concern about uh, the disease? Was it a concern about online learning and a desire to be face-to-face? -face? But we are in the midst of being very deliberate in reaching out to those students, finding out what those barriers were and doing what we can to bring them back. Great. And what I'd like to say is on behalf of CSCU, we love partnerships. So we will definitely be reaching out. Are there any other questions by other, any other members of the committee? We are uh, eight minutes from the end of the, of the time and we can, we, can, we can let everybody have those eight minutes back of their lives. Um, if seeing if there are no other questions, then we will. Um, I'll, I'll say thank you very much to the to the folks for uh, uh, making yourself available to us today. I would also just very, very briefly mention that um, Senator Flexer, I know, wanted to be here. Uh, regrets that she was she was my sub my subcommittee co chair. Regrets that she could not attend. She's running um, a hearing in GAE right now, um, and such as. Um, you know, the, the, the problems of uh, being a legislator, we're, we're even by Zoom, we're double booked. Um, but thank you very much for your time. And um, uh, Representative Hall, did you have any final closing words? No, just thanks everybody for the effort. The explanations were really comprehensive and very detailed. So I appreciate all that. And thank you all for being here today. It's good seeing everybody's face. Very good. Very much. Detailed as well, higher ed does best, so. <laughs> Thank 